We've laid out all the groundwork, so now let's use our foundation and build out an endpoint with more functionality. And we're going to start out with the easiest use case and use our test suite to give us confidence to make our system more complex. I'm going to create a new route, which I'm going to call code review videos endpoint. You can, of course, call it anything you like. But I'm going to do this in a test driven manner. So I'm creating my test first, and this route is going to allow us to post in some data. What I want to happen is for any data that's posted in, it should get added to the list of known about things. And then that list should be sent back as the response to the user. At this stage, when we run the test suite, we should expect that this test fails because we have no implementation. It's a little bit easier to see if we use the jest functionality to filter down and only run this specific test. And we can do this by pressing P on the keyboard and typing in a unique enough part of the path to the test that we want to run. And this can work for individual tests or entire directories. It's a really cool feature. We've got our test, so let's move on to creating the implementation. Now, all routes inside a Core application follow the same pattern. This will feel very familiar to you if you've ever used Express. Wherever we're defining routes, we're going to create a new instance of the router. And on that instance, there are various methods that we can call. You can take a look at the documentation. There's a link in the show notes if you'd like to know every possible method that we can call. But most commonly, we're going to deal with the HTTP verbs. So that would be get, post, put, patch and delete. It's important to know that the router is just another middleware in our Coa application. In Coa, pretty much everything is middleware. This has two immediate implications for us. The first is that we need to make sure that we export this router instance and then import it inside our app and use these routes. We'll get to that momentarily. And we've already seen with the health check that if we don't do this, then our routes aren't actually going to be available. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, but certainly most confusingly, is understanding how the middleware process works inside a core application. So you can see here a documentation page, which has a really nice graphic, which explains the middleware process. I'd strongly advise that you take a look at this page. It's linked inside the show notes. You can do some really interesting things with Coa's middleware. We're doing perhaps the most basic thing that you can do. Perhaps the most confusing thing for me when I first started with Coa was how we're getting the context and why we don't need to return the context object from our middleware. A simplistic way to think about this may be to think that each function is inside an array and there's a function above this that contains that array. And so every function inside that array is going to be called by this top level function, which is going to contain this context object. And each one of those functions is going to be given the context, but that context is global to the function above. And so whenever we mutate it inside one of these sub functions, we're mutating that global object, if you think of global and in inverted commas. And that's why we don't need to return it because it's that same object that gets passed to each of those functions. And we're just mutating that one object. This can feel a little unusual as we never really have to directly deal with that top level function, but just be aware that it's running in the background. And as I say, that's a very simplistic view of how this works. I would strongly advise reading through the documentation on middleware as it is a core part of Coa. It should also be said that you can drop my context entirely as an argument to that function because each of those functions is going to have access to the context through closure. In other words, each of these functions closes over the my simple top level middleware function and so has access to any of the variables within it. Okay, so back to our application, we currently have a failing test, even though we've added our implementation. And that's because, as mentioned just previously, we need to make sure that inside our server, we're using those new routes or just the root in this case, singular. Whether it's singular or plural, the process is identical. Once we've completed this task, we should have a passing test. As I mentioned at the start of the video, we're going with the easiest possible path to make our tests pass. And then once we have a passing test and a bit of confidence, we can start making our application a bit more dynamic. In order to get our tests to pass, we set up a games list where we'd hard coded the value of World of Warships, which is fine to get our initial test pass in. But if we want to add in a second test where we're testing that a different game name can be posted in and we should see that game come back as part of the response, then that second test is not going to pass. Now, as a side note, the way I'm going to create this test is to use a for each loop over as many games as I want to test. There is a jest extension, which will allow you to create cases where you don't need to do it like this, 
I don't think it's worthwhile in adding yet another extension to this project just for that particular use case. I'm quite happy with using a for each. And as long as the it statement comes inside the for each rather than the for each living inside the it statement, we should get multiple test runs rather than one test run with many games. Don't worry too much about that if you don't understand it. I use this pattern quite happily across multiple projects with no real issues. And as another side note, I sometimes get asked why I use a for each and not a map. Most people seem to go to maps when they're going across an array. Well, a map returns a new object. So if you're creating a new array, then use map. But if you just want to loop over as in a for each or a for without any consequences to what gets returned, then a for each is technically the correct one to use. In order to make this test pass, the criteria is simply to return whatever was posted in as the only game in the list. And so again, I can cheat a little bit here and do the least amount of work and just return whatever was sent in as part of the request body as the only element in our list. Why this is cheating or won't work as we go forward is because once our list grows past one element, unless we're sending in multiple elements, this is going to fail because it's not going to return anything that was in the list previously. But for now, this should be good enough. Now I made a slight mistake here when updating to use a for each loop. We're no longer sending in the game with the hard coded value. We should be just sending in the game, whatever string was in that element of the list. And that should be enough to get our test to passing, which it looks like it is, so that's good. Now one little tweak that I'm going to make to our test is to add in the game name that's specifically being tested in this particular loop. Just need to change it up from a regular string to a template string, and then we can use a variable inside that string. And we can see a little bit nicer output now on our test output. Now to finish up here, I'm just gonna demonstrate the problem that we've just been talking about, which is that if we've posted in a game already, and then we post in a second game, we should expect to see both games return in our list. But in our case, we're not gonna see that. We're just gonna see the most recent game that we've posted in. In order to address this problem, we're gonna need some persistence, which we're going to use Redis for. We can of course use a database or any other persistence layer that you prefer. So we'll get on with fixing this in the very next video.